I've been asked um, so many times, to people of atheists, non-believers, and I've seen plenty of videos and comments um, when it comes to people that use God's word kind of against them, and they, they ask this question, they say, well, how can your God, who's a God of love, kill innocent women and children? And, you know, I just, <clears throat> I've been asked that couple that question a couple times, and I had this one dude ask me a few years ago, quite a few years ago, actually, and then I prayed about it, and the Lord gave me this really cool revelation, and um, which I've shared on my YouTube channel before, I don't want to share that whole revelation right now, but basically it was about two sons, and um, it's just really good. And I just want to share the, the understanding that I got through it without taking up your time to tell the whole story but because it is hard to to wrap our minds around because we look at love as you know I don't know we I mean we just look at it we, we, we kind of filter it through our own emotions and and unfortunately the love of people it usually requires the love to be returned or we sometimes get angst or whatever against people but God's love is different God's love is unconditional so I just want to answer this question like how is God God of love if he kills innocent women and children and I think all of us have probably heard this this question especially if you're evangelizing and but for starters no one's innocent there's no one innocent you know all of us have heard the scripture that you know for everyone has fallen short of the glory of God. And there's not one righteous, no, not one. And, however, God made a covenant or a promise, an agreement with Abraham. He made one with Noah. He made one with David. And the most important one is the one that he made with himself or his son, Jesus Christ. And this is the one that we're in now, the covenant of peace. But I want to talk about this covenant that he made with Abraham. And it's interesting because we know the scriptures say that God isn't a man that he should lie. And something about something someone that can't lie is they keep a contract if they've made one. And so God tells Abraham, he's like, the seed is going to come forth. And if you think about a seed, what happens to a seed? A seed has to die and then new life comes. So the seed was Jesus Christ. So he makes a promise with Abraham that the seed is going to come forth. And then he selects the Hebrew people, Israel, for this seed to come through. So now the devil, not knowing exactly when Jesus was going to come, not exactly when the seed was going to come. Remember the story with Moses when, oh, I can't remember who was king then, Pharaoh, whatever. Um, he puts a command out to kill all the, the boys under two years old. And we see this again with Herod, same thing with Jesus. You know, this is why they, you know, David and, or, and Joseph and Mary, you know, they flee. And because the devil didn't know when the seed was going to come, but he did know that it was going to come. So he did everything in his power to try to stop the seed from coming because he knew. This is what he knew what was said in Genesis that the seed is going to, is going to crush his head. And, so he's doing everything in his power. So he used people as pawns to try and come against the people of Israel. You, you read all, all through the text. And yes, God did say, kill them all. Kill them all. And we think, well, man, how, how is this love? And it's because we're actually looking at it through the lens of our own understanding. And we all know the scripture, don't lean on your own understanding. But... There's a Proverbs, I think it's in Proverbs 18, I'm not sure where it's at, but it says that those who fear the Lord will have all understanding. I don't know if that's in this life or the one to come, but um, I, I hold on to that scripture and I take it to the Lord. And I'm like, Lord, you need to give me some understanding on this thing. And, and he definitely has. So the devil is the one here that's to blame, not God, because it was a devil who... Basically, I don't want to use the word in these people, but could have very well been, I would probably say so, that would come against Israel to try to kill them. So 
God wasn't killing. God was in basically self-defense of his word, of his promise. He had to keep this promise that he made. And it's like, it's like you, if, if your dad makes a promise with you, you know, your dad's going to see it happen. And if he's righteous, he's going to make this promise at all costs. And that's what God did. So these people that came against Israel to try to remove this seed, yes, God removed them. Because the seed had to come forth so that we can have new life. The seed had to die so that we can have new life. And this is the life of Christ, the life in the Spirit. So what, what's super awesome is it's like, well, this doesn't really seem fair. Not understanding God, not understanding the love of God, not understanding maybe the Scriptures. But there's a scripture in Romans 3.25. There's a, actually there's a, a few of them, but this one talks about how God didn't impute or legally charge the sins of those from former times. I fully believe he's talking about these people that came against Israel. He's talking about all the people that came before Jesus. And we read in 1 Peter 4 verse 6. Well, let's back up. In Ephesians 4, it talks about Jesus descending to the center of the earth. Well, what did he do there? Well, the first place he went, according to Scripture, is he, he made, an, like it says in Colossians, he made an open spectacle of the enemy. He went and visited this portion in the center of the earth, or wherever it is, or whatever you know, whatever name you want to call it. But in, in this part where literally the demons that were on earth that were formerly disobedient during the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, says this verbatim. So for this, you know, hundred-ish year period, these devils, demons that tried to take out humanity were put into a completely different chamber place. Jesus goes down there and basically, in my opinion, is he said, ha, you lose, I win. And then he goes to another place where the dead were. And it says, it says right there, it says that Jesus preached the gospel to those who were dead so that they can receive him as if in the flesh. Which is saying, you know, I mean, could you imagine <laughs> being down there and, you know, I can't, you know, I don't know if these people can think or what, but, you know, man, this, you know, we're down here in this shithole. <laughs> and, you know, it, whatever, whatever. And, um, you know, the, the, those that, that we say were the innocent ones, you know. But here's Jesus and his great love he goes to these people and he says to them, hey, I am he, <laughs> the savior of the world, Emmanuel, I am God with you. And it says there that, you know, <laughs> that he preached the gospel to those who were dead so that they could receive him as if in the flesh, just as if they were alive. As if I came up to you on the street or somebody else came up to you on the street you know, and if your response ever is or has been, well, how can, you know, your God, a God of love, kill innocent women and children? Well, I hope that this kind of explains it. Because also in Isaiah 61 and also in Luke, we see Jesus saying, um, you know, I, I come to take captivity captive. These people were in captivity and Jesus took him captive with him to heaven to be with the Father. So... You know, in our mind, it is hard to wrap around, you know, how God does things. And that's to me, is really what makes him worthy to worship because I can't figure him out. <laughs> if I could figure him out, we'd be equal. And I, I wouldn't have any reason to worship something that's equal with me. But God is so far above us, you know, that sometimes we can't wrap our mind around it. And this is when it comes to just trusting that he knows what he's doing. But I do totally believe that these people, um, you know, that did come against Israel, that did have their lives taken from them, have been given a new life in Christ. And when we really get our mind off of this earth and set it above, you know, it begins to change our perspective because this life is just a, you know, I tell people that it's like this little raindrop that falls into an ocean. You know, that life is like a raindrop and the ocean is like eternity. And that little raindrop, you know, compared to a, a sea 
is just, you know, it's in comparison, incomparable. So, if you've ever had that thought, you know, I hope this helps. And if you ever had anyone ask you, um, feel free to, to, st to steal this one. Um, or I hope that the Lord can give you a greater understanding and you can act actually add to it. You know, oh, what's that one scripture? Be ready in season and out, that one. To help you be ready in season and out. You know, and because there are some tough questions out there. There are a lot of people who who don't think God is love, and but God is love. So I really hope that this helps. Uh, just kind of a cool little thing that I wanted to share, um, and be rest assured that that God has a plan. You know, He had a plan way back then, and if God kept His promises to Israel, then. To, to man, how much more so do you think that he's going to keep his promises through Jesus? Because he keeps his promises, he keeps his word, he's not a man that he should lie. Love you guys. Peace.